Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> All right, again, always thank you, DJ Dr. Fabulous. Okay, uh, so real quick, some announcements for the course. Uh, in terms of projects, Project 3 will be released today-ish, tomorrow-ish, uh, and that'll be due in November on Sunday. Uh, this will be due on the 15th. I've updated it yesterday, and now it's due on the Sunday, on the 17th. Homework 3 will be released next week, so we don't have to worry about that yet, uh, but that, that'll be due before, the, uh, before Project 3. The other major announcement, too, is that, uh, with my, as I said in the beginning of the semester, my wife is pregnant. Uh, I think it's mine. Um, <laughs> and so they are taking it out of her on, uh, on Wednesday night. I had them schedule it after the Sigma deadline on Tuesday, which is the big database conference. So it's happening on Wednesday. So next week, I won't be here. Uh, DJ Drop Tables will be here. And then my PG students will, uh, will teach those two lectures. And then depending on what happens, I should be back uh, maybe the following week or so. Uh, and we may adjust, there's that, um, I think we, we, they told me originally it was coming out the 30th, so I canceled class on the 30th, but now it's coming out whatever this Wednesday is or Thursday. Uh, so I might adjust whatever that, that day off is. But the goal is to get all the material you need to do homework uh, number three uh, in, the, in the next two weeks, okay? Any questions about this? I will post this on Piazza with, with, uh, with you know, more information. It's real. All right. Um, all right. The other change also, too, is that the original schedule was that last class before the midterm was all about query optimization. We obviously ran out of time. So I've decided to split that lecture now into two parts. So this is part two. And then I've dropped the lecture on uh, embedded database logic, which is not really something we need to know to, in order to build a database system. It's sort of just a, uh, an overview with you, for you guys to understand, like, oh, there's other things you can do other than, than just throwing SQL at, at the database. Uh, so if you're curious about that, you know, I'll send the, post the link on Piazza. You can watch last, last year's lecture on, on that topic. Um, query optimization is kind of more important, so I, I think it's better to spend more time on this. Okay? All right, so last class, when we started talking about query optimization, we focused on this first part here, right? How to do, apply rules and heuristics to make changes to the, to the query plan uh, without having to, to examine the data or understand what the, what the database actually looks like on, on the inside. We may need to look at the catalog to understand what our attributes are, whether they're unique or not, and whether we have foreign keys, but we don't need to know anything about you know, our distribution of values in the tables look, look a certain way, or we have this number of tuples, right? So these are all rules that we could do without actually looking at, uh, understanding, you know, what our tuples look like. So today, now, we're going to focus on the second part here, which is the more complica complicated part, uh, where we're now going to use a cost model to allow us to assess the, the, the quality or the amount of work we're going to have to do for a query plan without, before we even actually run it. And the idea here is that we want to be able to enumerate as many query plans as possible and then pick whatever, which one we think is the best. And so the more accurate our cost model is, the more accurate our selection will be for what the best query plan is. But as you see as you go along, it's, this is super hard and everybody's going to get this wrong. And then what I'll teach you today is the way sort of textbook shows, uh, tells you how to do it, which is, which is really, really wrong. Uh, but we'll talk about a little bit how we can possibly fix these things, but this is something we could recover in the advanced class, or if you take more, it, it, you know, you can do, people have done dissertations on this kind of thing, and it's still, still a unsolved problem. All right, so today's agenda, we're going to first talk about how to do, again, plan cost estimation with our cost model, then we'll talk about how to do enumeration, how we're actually going to intelligi intelligently iterate over different possible query plans in order to find the one that we think is the best. Right, because again, this is NP hard, we can't do an exhaustive search, so we, we need to be smart about what we're actually looking at. And then we'll finish up talking about nested subqueries because this is slightly different than everything else and there's rules we can use to, to rewrite them and, and uh, to make them more efficient. So we already talked about this last class. We, talked this, uh, we said that, you know, what is a cost estimation? What is our cost model actually doing? And again, it is essentially, it's an, a way to approximate how much work or how long it's going to take to execute a query. And in general, we always want to pick the one that's going to have the lowest cost. So this cost could be a combination of a bunch of different underlying uh, hardware metrics, because you know, that corresponds to the work we're actually going to do. 
So it could just be how much CPU we're actually going to use. This is typically very hard to do, and we don't do this for a disk-based system because the disk is the major bottleneck, but an in-memory system, we care about this. Uh, we've already talked about how to do uh, counting disk I.O. for our join algorithms and sort algorithms. This is probably the major thing that we're, that we're going to focus on. We also care about how much memory we're going to use. There could be one algorithm that uses a lot of memory and gets faster performance, but we may not have that much memory to actually use, so therefore we want to choose a, a slower algorithm that uses less memory. Uh, because that'll be less pressure on the system. And then for distributed databases, it's again, it's the number of network messages is the high pull in the tent because sending things over the wire to between machines is always uh, expensive. And so in general, at a high level, these are all going to be a proxy for, are we going to use the number of tuples we're going to access as a proxy for all these things, right? Essentially determining how much data we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pass from one operator to the next, and we can use that to derive which one we think is the best. So as I said, we can't just, you know, the, the, the way to get the most accurate estimation of what a query plan is going to do is actually just to execute the query plan. But if we're looking at thousands and thousands of different possible query plans, we can't possibly execute every single one. So we need a way to, to approximate this. And this is what our cost model is going to do. And the underlying concept we're going to use, or an underlying uh, component in our database system we're going to use to do these estimations is the internal uh, statistic catalogs of the database system. So every database system that does has a query optimizer that is using a cost-based search is going to have this statistics module, which is going to allow it to collect information about what the tables look like, what, what, are actually, what are actually inside of the tuples. And how you collect this information can vary based on the implementation. Uh, so all the major systems have a way to force the database system to collect new statistics. Right, analyze, analyze table, update stats, run stats. Right, this tells the data system, hey, do a sequential scan on my table and update my statistics information. Some systems also can run this in cron jobs, like every, every, every so often, periodically, just do a pass. Other systems can piggyback off of the queries as they run and say, all right, as I'm doing sequential scan, I'll also update my statistics as I go along. Other systems have triggers to say, if the 10% of my, or 20% of my table has changed, let me go fire off the run stats. Uh, command and, and update things. Right? There's no one way to do this better than another. A common setup would be you, it, like, if you're running an OTP system, you would disable this during the day when you're doing most of your transactions, but then at nighttime you could take, take passes through and, and update your stats. So during the day it's going to be slightly off, but that's still going to be okay. Right? Because this, this is expensive to do, because this, again, this is a sequential scan on the entire table. So let's dabble in a little math, but it's Andy math, not hard math. So uh, everyone should be able to follow this. So the basic main information we're going to maintain about every table is just the number of tuples that they have and the, the number of distinct values we're going to have for every single attribute within our table. So we're actually going to maintain this as a separate counter because we just can't assume that you know, I have X number of pages and therefore, I can fit x, you know, y tuples in each page, and it's x times y, because, again, not every slot in every page will be full. And then when we talk about multi-version concurrency control, we're going to have multiple physical copies, or multiple physical versions of every single logical tuple. So we can't just you know, count the number of blocks we have. We actually want to maintain this as a separate count. And then we'll talk about how we're actually going to compute the, or maintain this information to get the, the number of distinct values uh, for every single attribute. So now, with this basic information, we can now derive a new statistic called the, the selection cardinality, defined by this function SC. And this is just going to be compute the average number of records we're going to have for a given attribute uh, with that same value. So for every single distinct value, I would say, you know, here's the number of times that, that it occurs. So we just take the number of tuples that we have, and we divide it by the number of unique attributes that we have, and that tells us for every single attribute how many times it occurs. What's wrong with this? Right, he says one, like, so he says one could be a thousand, one could be one, and this formula completely misses it. Absolutely. So this is one of the big assumptions we're going to make throughout the entire lecture, and that is we're going to assume that we have uniform data. So this formula basically is just saying, Every single value occurs, uh, every, for every unique value that I have in my table for this attribute, it occurs the, the same number of times as all other values. 
But we know that's not how the real world works, right? So take like CMU, for example. CMU roughly has 10,000 students. It's more than that, but just, it's simple math. And it roughly has, I think it actually does have 10 colleges. So if you assume you have uniform data, then you would say for all the 10,000 students, you take 10,000 divided by, by 10, and that's the number of students that are in each college. It's exactly the same for every college. But we know that's not the case, right? The school of computer science, where, where I'm in, that has way more students than the school of fine arts. Right? So real world data is skewed, but to make our math easier for what we're talking about today, we're going to assume that everything is uniform. But again, this is another example where the real world doesn't work this way. Real world systems have to account for this. And we'll briefly talk about how to do that. All right, so with this selection cardinality, what, what can we do with this? Well, the goal is for us to now figure out how many tuples we're actually going uh, to, to select during our scans, using our predicates. Because that's when we need to figure out how many tuples each operator is going to spit out and feed into the next operator. And then we can use that to figure out how much work they're actually going to do, how much disk they're going to use, how much memory they're going to use. So we're using the selection, selection cardinality to figure out for, our, for the given input we're, we're provided from our children operators, how much, how much data is coming out of us. So if we want to get for an equality predicate on a unique key, this is the easiest thing to do, and our, our math will work out great. Right? So say we have a simple table, the people table. We have an ID column that's the primary key. So if I have a lookup that says ID equals 1, 2, 3, then that's easy. I know the cardinality is going to be 1. I'm going to have one tuple that's going to match for no matter how many tuples I actually have in, in my table. Because right? it's, it's, it's a primary key. It's unique. Where things go, get hard is now when you have more complex predicates, like range predicates or conjunctions. Because now I need to be able to combine the selection cardinality for these different predicates in, in sort of in non-trivial ways. So, oh shit, sorry. Um, so the, based on the selection cardinality, now we're going to produce this idea of, of, of selectivity of a single predicate. So selectivity is basically a function that says, for a given predicate on a table, what is, again, what are the number of tuples that are actually going to qualify? So the form that we're going to use to compute this will depend on what kind of operation that we're actually doing. Right, the last one I just showed you was an equality predicate on a, on a unique, unique attribute. But you know, now we need to account for the case where it may not be unique, or we're looking at non, you know, inequalities or range, ranges. So let's look at some simple examples here. So assume now in our people table for the age column, we only have five unique values, right, 0 through 4. Right, so think of this as like instead of storing the exact age of somebody, we're putting them into to groups. Like a, a, internet advertising or a, advertisers do this all the time. Like people under the age 18, 18 to 35, 35 to 50, and so forth. So we have uh, five distinct values. And for our table here, we have just five people. So if we want to compute now the selectivity of an equality predicate, right, you know, where something equals a constant, then we just take the, the selection cardinality of our predicate divide that by the number of tuples that we have, and that's going to tell us what percentage of the tuples are going to match uh, in our table. So in this case here, for selectivity of age equals 2, assume we have like a simple histogram of all the tuples we have. And since we said that the, we are assuming that our, our distribution of values is uniform, every, every, every distinct age has a, an exact value or the same number of occurrences. So to compute the selectivity, it's just taking this, uh, which is the selection cardinality of age equals 2, because it's only one. You know, we're only looking at one value. We just look in our histogram. We find exactly uh, you know, the number of occurrences of this. Right? So it's just 1 over 5. Again, so this one here, we're assuming uniform uh, distribution, and we're assuming that uh, we would know exactly what this value is, and therefore this math works out great. Right? This, this is exactly what we want. But we now have to do some more complex things, like getting a, a range predicate. So now we say where age is greater than or equal to 2. Well, the formula is, assumes here that we're, that we're, we're only looking at integers uh, that are continuous. We have a continuous range of, of values we can look at. So you just take the max value divided by the minus the one you're looking for, divided by the, the range of the max minus min, and that'll tell you what, roughly what the selectivity is. So in this case here, we're looking for everybody that's two or greater. So we take the min and the max, subtract that, that's four. 
Then we just take the, the, the value we're looking for and the high value that we want, and it's four minus two, so it's one, one over two. So this is wrong, right? The real answer is actually three fifths, but the way the formula works out, we get one half. So this is a good example where like these formulas don't always work correctly and they're gonna produce errors. In this case here, we're underestimating the, the, the selectivity. It should be three fifths, not one half. So this is gonna be problems when, uh, you know, when you start doing you know, estimations of a complex queries that have a bunch of different predicates and a bunch of different operators, because now we have errors built on errors built on errors. So say this is like we're doing the scan at the bottom of the tree, and now we have an underestimation of the number of tuples we're gonna, we're gonna produce as our output. Now when we do calculations up above, now we're taking wrong inputs or wrong estimations as our, as our input to our operators, and then doing more wrong math on them, and producing more errors. So in many cases, or the, the research shows that for almost, actually for every single database system they evaluated for this one particular paper, everybody underestimates the selectivity of all these operators. And you may say, all right, who cares? How's that, why is that big of a big deal? But now when you start sizing up your, uh, you know, your, your data structures, like your, join, your hash tables for joins, your buffers for sorting, now you're gonna underestimate what, what these sizes are. And you may have to correct that once you realize I have more data than I actually than I expected. So these have real runtime implications uh, for in systems. And also too, we're making now wrong estimations about you know, what plan might be better than another. All right, the last three I wanna look at are negation. This one's pretty straightforward, right? It's just one minus whatever the selectivity of the predicate that we want, right? So in this case here, the, sele the selection cardinality of age equals two is one. So the negation is just the, the boundaries outside of that, right? And you get four fifths, which is the, the correct answer for this one, right? Because assuming that something equals something. So the major observation we can make about this is that this select selectivity estimate for predicates is basically the same thing as the probability, right? It's just saying, what is, what is the probability that a tuple is gonna match uh, my given predicate? So if we make this assumption, now we can use all the, the tricks that we, we learned from you know, statistics 101 to start combining together these, these predicates in more complex ways. So let's say that now we wanna have a conjunction. You know, age equals two and name like, uh, you know, a wildcard. So we would have this, compute the selectivity on the first predicate, age equals two, compute the second uh, uh, selectivity on the, on the second predicate, and then now we just combine them or, or multiply the two, uh, the two probabilities together, and we get their intersection here, right? This is where, you know, we, we'd say it has to be an exact match, or sorry, it would have to match both, and it would be this inner part here, right? And so the same thing for disjunction. Disjunction, the, the formula is slightly different, but you're, again, you're just assuming that, the, that, they're, that they're independent, and therefore you can use the standard math trick to figure out what the union is here. So I've talked about two assumptions so far that are problematic. But this, again, this, this is what the way every textbook covers it. Uh, the first is that we assume that our data is uniform, but I showed a simple example where that's not the case. And then here now we're assuming that our data is in the, or, 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 our predicates are independent. That's also not always the case, too. There's actually a third assumption they're always going to make that's problematic. It's called the joint inclusion principle. So again, so there's a bunch of assumptions we're making about computing the cardinality of our predicates that make the math easier, but are going to end up having us produce incorrect uh, approximations. So again, uniform data assumes that everything is always going to be the a curve with the same probability. The way to get around that for, for heavy hitters, so heavy hitter would be like, if you, if you have really skewed data and there's like 10 columns or 10 values that occur, you know, majority of the time, you can maintain a separate hash table or histogram to keep track of those guys. And then everyone else you just assume is uniform and derive the, the, the cardinality, cardinality estimates based on that. So that's the standard trick to get around the uniform data issue. We, we then we talked about the independent predicates, so that allows me to take two predicates and if there's a conjunction, just multiply them together to produce the, the, you know, the, the combined cardinality. And then the inclusion principle says that if I'm doing a join of two tables, then for every single tuple in my inner table, I'll have a tuple that matches in the outer table. Right, but that's not always the case. But you know, you know, the way to think about this is like, why would I join two tables if, if there's no way to actually join them, there's no actually corresponding values that would match. 
So we, we make that assumption, but in the real world, it's not always going to be the case because you, you could have dangling, you know, uh, or you could have references that don't, don't exist anymore in, in the outer table. So these two are the ones that are probably most problematic. This one occurs uh, in more advanced things we don't need to worry about. So I always like to show this one example to sort of, hit, uh, to, to sort of emphasize and show exactly why this is problematic. Um, and this comes from a blog article written by a former IBM researcher. And so Guy Lemon worked on like the early, uh, one of the early IBM optimizers from the late 1980s, early 1990s that, that's actually still used today in DB2. It was pretty influential. So he has a blog article that he likes to show you. Uh, here's why the, the you know, assumptions we're making here are, are problematic. Let's say we have a, a database with a single table of cars, and we have two attributes. We have the, the make and the model. So the make would be like Honda, uh, Toyota, Tesla. The model would be like Camry, Accord, uh, you know, Escort. And let's say we have a query that says where make equals Honda and model equals Accord. So if you make the assumption about that, we, that we've made so far, the two assumptions about the independence and uniformity of our data, then when we combine this, these two predicates together, we would say 1 over 10, because that's that we have 10 makes and Honda is 1, so that's 1 over 10. And then we have 1 over 100 models, because we have 100 models, a quarter is one of them. So we'd mul multiply them together, and our cardinality estimate would, need, would be 0 0.001. But we as humans know that these values are actually correlated, or these two predicates are correlated. Like you can't make an accord, like there's no other car manufacturer that's going to make an accord, it's only a Honda. So if you know the model equals Accord, you can then know that the, the make has to be Honda. And so the correct selectivity for this particular query is actually 1 over 100. So we're order of magnitude off from what the, the, the formula would actually tell us what we think we are from what, what, what we actually should be. Yes? So the question is, if you had a foreign key, would that make your life easier? No, but you would have to know whether the the foreign key child is uh, is unique, because it could be one to n or or one to one. You have to know something about that. But even then, the foreign key, I think, for this particular example, doesn't help you. I have to think about that though. But it, for this one, it's one table. Where, like, this is just like one table. Give me all the cars where the make equals Honda and the model equals Accord. When it has nothing to do with, like, you know, with doing a join, right? I need to think about whether the, whether the joins get, or whether the foreign keys would help with that. Let's, we can take that offline. So again, like, we're order magnitude off. So now we start making estimations about how much work we're actually going to have to do for our query plan uh, and sizing up our intermediate data structures and our buffers. And we're, we're going to be way off. So the independent assumption and uh, it's going to cause us to, to underestimate how much work we're actually going to do. So the way to get around this particular issue, and this is something that the only, I think, the high-end commercial systems actually do, is to do correlated column statistics. So I could tell the database system, all right, model is correlated to make. Right? I can't make an accord. If I, if I know that my model is an accord, I know what my make is. Or another example would be like if I know my, my zip code or, of an address field, is 15217 that I know the state has to be Pennsylvania. So if you if you declare these these columns as being correlated, now the database system can can you know special case its estimations to avoid the, these pitfalls. It can know that these things are correlated and therefore it, it can use the right formula to derive the selectivity of it. But as I said, only the high-end systems do this. Yes. Your question, your statement is, it doesn't need to know how it's correlated, just that they are correlated. I'd have to go look to see what the syntax supports. I think you just say they are correlated, and it should figure it out. Okay. Yeah. Like, I think only, only Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, Teradata, maybe Snowflake can do this, but like MySQL and Postgres can't do this, as far as I know. SQLite certainly can't do this. All right, so let's talk about now how we're actually going to get this information that tells us like the number of makes and number of models, like, the number of occurrences of every value. So I've already sort of mentioned this before, but the, the database system is going to maintain histograms on the inside to keep track of these statistics. 
So the most simplest histogram would be for every single distinct value that I have in my column, I just count the number of occurrences that I have. Right? So in this case here, uh, this is our uniform data. So I have 15 unique values, and you know, each one occurs five times. And so now we want to say, you know, what's the number of uh, uh, tuples that are going to match? You know, does something equal five? I could look at this and say, I, I know it's exactly you know, five. But again, real data doesn't look like this. Real data is, is more skewed. And so now, again, if we have a history like this, this is fine, because now we can say, you know, how many, how many tuples have five? We, we would know the exact value. What's the problem with this, though? For every single value I have in my, in my column, I'm storing an entry in my hash table from a histogram. That's going to be a lot, right? Assume, that, assume this, this count here is like 32 bits. So in my simple example here, I have 15 unique values. So you know, uh, 15 times 32 bits is roughly 50, 60 kilobytes, or 50, sorry, 50, 60 bytes. It's nothing. But now if I have a billion va unique values and I have a 32-bit integer for every single unique value, now, 1 billion times 32 bits is 4 gigabytes. Right? That's, just the, that's just the histogram from one column. So now I'm going to do this for every single column. So nobody's actually going to store exact values like this, except for the heavy hitter stuff that I talked about before. So that the heavy hitter, you would have the exact value, but you only store maybe like the top 10 or 20 unique values for every single column. You're not storing this for every single possible one. So the way to get around this is to com start combining together uh, these values into buckets so that we only store a single value for the bucket rather than a, uh, an a individual value for every single element of the bucket. Right, so this would be called an equiwith histogram. So basically you would take the, uh, every three values here, compute whatever the count is, the sum of all the, the occurrences for every single value in, in that bucket, and then now my new histogram just has that aggregate value. Right, so I'm doing, I'm doing buckets of size three, but you, you, can, you, can, you can size them any way you want. So now the way to get an estimate to say, you know, how many times does, say, the number, number two occur, I would look to see what, what bucket does my value that I'm looking for fall into. So two is between one and three. And then I would say, what's the count here? So in this case, roughly nine. I have three values, so I take nine divided by three, and now I'm estimating that two occurs, uh, you know, three times. So again, we're saving space, we're saving computational overhead of maintaining our histogram, but now we're, again, we're introducing more errors in our approximations. Because you know, there's no other way to get around this other than storing exact values. So this is not so great either, because now I could have, going back here, between this bucket, right, eight had a, had a high count, seven and nine were much lower, but then when I'm combining them together, I don't know which one actually had the high count. Right, my heavy hitter could handle that, but we can ignore, ignore that for now. So a better way to do this is actually to use quantiles. So with this one, we're going to do is we're going to have the we're going to vary the width of our buckets. So the last one, the buckets are always the same width, but now we're going to vary the width such that the the sum of the counts for each bucket is roughly the same. So in this case here, I can have the first bucket would have values from one to five. The count goes to two. Six, seven, and eight has has three three values, but the count's twelve. Sorry, the yeah, count's twelve. Count's twelve. Nine and twelve. And so now I have variable length buckets, but now I can potentially have more accurate estimations of of the the, the occurrences of values within those buckets. And then this one here, I'm showing quantiles. You can do the deciles and, and other other grouping sizes. So any questions about this? Again, this is what we're going to populate. When we run analyze or run stats in our database system, it's going to generate this information for us and store this in our catalog. And it's durable in disk. When we restart the system, we come back and we don't have to run analyze again. All, our, all of our statistics are still there. Yes? So like if I increase, uh, if I add 10 values of 5, then it will redistribute some of them to the next one. This question is, if I add now, if I add 10 more, 10 more values to 5, so now it, it shoots up, what will happen in my, my histogram. So this gets blown away every single time I run analyze. I recompute everything. So yes, in that case, it could, could, could vary the, now the size of the, of the, of the bucket. It is not being updated at Correct. So as far as you know, in most systems, they don't maintain these things as you do inserts and updates, because it's just too expensive. Because again, we'll talk about transactions on, on Wednesday, but 
when I'm running a transaction, I want to minimize the amount of work I have to do. So anything that's not important right now, I want to, I'm going to put off till later because I'm holding locks on, on tuples and that's interfering with other, other transactions running at the same time. So I don't want to maintain this as I go along. Now you could say, all right, I could, I could have like a, a separate background thread, could look at recent changes from the log and then go apply these changes. Yes, you can do that. Some systems might do that, but in general, everyone blows it away and restarts from scratch. The one system that tr does try to do the updates on the fly was, uh, was IBM DB2's Leo, the learning optimizer. They would, they, get, they would run a scan, then go back and update this thing, but you know, it, it has issues. Okay. So, the histograms and these and the sketches and or we didn't talk about sketches, but like these histograms and these heavy hitter stuff, that's the way you know the, sort of the most data systems do this. Another alternative, instead of using these 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 additional data structures, is that we could just maintain a sample of the table and derive our statistics from from the sample. So the way to think about the histograms is like it's a it's essentially a a lower resolution copy of of the database of the tables right it's an approximation of, of their contents so but rather than having these histograms and try to derive statistics from them what if we actually just took a copy a smaller copy of the table itself and then ran our predicates on that smaller copy and then assume that the distribution of values within that that sample is the same as it exists in the real table and therefore, any our selectivity estimates we, we derive from the sample will accurately reflect what the what's in the real table. So let's say we have in our people table we have a billion tuples, and then, but let's say we just take a sample we're just going to get every other tuple and copy it into a sample table. Right, there's obviously more sophisticated sampling algorithms you can use, but for our purposes now this is fine. So now when my query comes along and, and I want to compute the, the selectivity of age equals age greater than 50, I go to my sample and I say, well, Obama's over the age of 50, uh, so therefore it's, it's one third, and therefore I can assume that the distributive values in my, my full table will match that. And in this case here, just like in the histograms, we could, ma we could maintain this as we go along, right, as, as, as you know, periodically refresh it, or we could trigger it whenever you know, we know that a large portion of the table has changed, or we do a bulk load, a bulk, bulk delete. But the idea here, again, is that rather than maintaining histograms that could be inaccurate, we just maintain a sample. So this only occurs, as far as I know, in the high-end systems. So SQL Server most famously does this, and their optimizer is probably the best one. Right? They, but they actually do a combination of the histograms and, and the sampling, which I think is the right thing to do. Okay. Yes. So like, um, like what makes this like more difficult than some sort of hiring system volunteer? Sadie, what, what what makes this more difficult than what? Like for like like why like only hiring systems do this? His, oh, his question is why is this the case that only like the high end commercial enterprise systems actually do this versus the you know the open source guys? Good question. Um, I think the, yeah, that's a good question. Because you, if you already have Analyze, you're going to do a sequential scan anyway to compute your histograms. You might as well just generate this thing. You actually don't, don't know the answer. It may be the case that just like the histogram way is the way it's always been done, right? That's not a very satisfying answer. Um, I mean, there, Here's, here's one thing. So I think, like with the histograms, you, the way you have it in your optimizer, you just have this cost model. Actually, here's probably the right answer. The histograms will be way faster, right? Because again, I'm enumerating all these possible different query plans. I can go to my histogram real quickly and derive this, the, the, the statistics I need to estimate the, the, the selectivity of a predicate or an operator. Whereas this thing, to compute the, the selectivity estimate, I have to do a sequential scan on it. That's definitely going to be slower than the than running through the histogram, right? So we can cover this in the advanced class. But the way it probably works in SQL Server, SQL Server probably says, if I recognize my query is super simple, just use the histograms. 
if I think it's going to be a, a lot of work, like it's going to take maybe minutes or hours to run, then who cares if I spend an extra couple seconds doing my, my sampling technique? Because that'll make a you know, big difference when I actually run the query. So it's probably that's the reason. The histograms are going to be faster. This one takes more work. And it's, it's also sort of weird, too, because like you're, like, you're doing a scan on something while you're running the optimizer. So it's like a, from an engineering standpoint, it might be hard to set up. Doing, cause like you said, like doing that search is expensive, so. Sorry, say that. Like running stuff on this table is expensive, relatively speaking. So like, if you don't have like good models, then you might end up spending more time just running all these samples instead of actually. No, but, but like, this is the model. Like, this is super simple. Like, like it's, you know, what's the selectivity of this predicate? That component of the cost model itself is, is independent, I think, of whether it's a histogram versus a sample. But yeah, the, uh, yeah so up above is the formula to be able to say, I'm going to do this amount of disk I.O. I'm going to, you know, this, this hash join is better than this other join. Yeah, if, if that's not, of all that other parts not very sophisticated, then maybe this doesn't matter. Question over here or? Yes. Uh, so how do you see it? a sample which comes out to be accurate for every query that you're trying to put? Right, so this question is, how do you actually create a sample that is going to be accurate for every single query that, uh, for, that you could ever possibly throw at it? My stupid sampling here is every other one. But clearly that's, like, we know it's stupid because maybe data inserts come, arise at different times and therefore the, the data that I insert today versus the data I inserted yesterday has different di distribution. And so maybe I want to sample differently or I could look at my predicate and say, well, I, it's, I'm only looking at you know, data that was inserted today. So therefore I'm gonna make sure my sample only includes that. This is, th this is where it gets hard. And it's again, probably the reason why the, the advanced, advanced systems do this better than, or do this and the open source guys don't do. Like there's, there's reservoir sampling, there's a whole bunch of other sampling, there's a lot of sampling techniques to try to come up with different ways to do this. I, I don't know what the commercial systems actually do. But hopefully you can see why the like, query optimization is super hard because like now you, you need to some, know some gnarly math to figure out like what is the right way to sample this. And actually you're right, it could depend on the query. Some queries, you know, uniform sampling might be perfect, other sampling techniques might be better for others. Yes? You mentioned that it might be like, hard to engineer like doing the table thing if you're Essentially, when you're doing a scan, like you're going to do, essentially, you have to build a separate table and then do a search on that table. So, like, if you're engineering it, so like, how do you, like, how do you, like? So, so, a statement from an engineering standpoint, this could be hard because, like, now you have a separate table, and then you you, need to, you, you want to be able to do a sequential scan on it, and ideally use the same execution code that you have to do sequential scans, and then in order to compute these statistics, yeah, it is it is like a chicken for the egg. I can't run a query until I have a query plan, but I can't get a query plan until I can run a query that can compute the sample. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, what do we have? We can now roughly, you know, emphasize on roughly, uh, we can rough, roughly estimate the selectivity of our predicates. What do we actually want to do with them? And again, as I said in the beginning, this is where we're going to do our cost, cost model or cost-based search to do query optimization. So for this one, again, in the pipeline, after we do all those, those rewrites with just the rules, now we're going to enter this, this cost model search, cost-based search, to try to figure out how to convert the logical plan into a physical plan. Right? The physical plan is what the data system actually executes. The logical plan that says, I want to join these two tables. The physical plan says, join these two tables with this algorithm and this buffer and this sort order and all that good stuff. So for... Single relations, it's pretty straightforward. We'll, we'll briefly talk about it. The one we're going to spend most of our time, which is the hardest one, is the, the multi-relations, multi or n-way joins. Because now it's not only worrying about the, the, you know, what joint algorithm I want to use, but what order I want to do my join. And remember I said last class, the number of possible query plans we could have is 4 to the n, where n is the number of tables we're joining. Right? Because again, it's for all my different joint algorithms. I can, I can join them in different orders, and I can join them either the, one with the inner versus the outer. Right, so the, so the search space explodes. So because this is incomplete, NP complete, we don't want to actually do an exhaustive search because we're never actually going to complete. Does it make sense to run our query optimizer for an hour if our query is only going to take you know one minute to run? That's not a good trade-off. 
So we need a way to figure out how to sort of shed work or, 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 or cut off query plans that we don't want to examine to reduce our search space so we can make this problem more tractable. So let's first talk about how we want to handle single relations, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about multiple relations. So for single relation query plans, the, the, the hardest problem we have to uh, deal with is picking our access method, right? The, the fallback option is always a sequential scan. It's the slowest, but it's always, it's, it's always correct. Then we can maybe want to do a binary search and we have a cluster index or pick, an, pick, pick a, you know, one, or two, one or multiple indexes to use for an index scan. The other thing we can care about also is the order in, in which we evaluate predicates. Like I have something and something. If the second predicate is more selected than the first one, maybe I want to evaluate that one first so I throw away more data uh, sooner rather than later. And then the, the second predicate evaluates always, you know, always true. So we can, you know, we, don't, we want to put that as the, the second one. So in most new database systems, like there's all these startups, all these new data systems coming along in the last 10 years. If they have a query optimizer, they're probably, in the, you know, they're probably just using heuristics that, in order to pick these things. Right? You don't actually truly need a, a sophisticated cost model to do this. I just say, you know, what, what index is the most selective? And that's the one I always want to pick. Or what predicates the most selective, and that's the one I always want to pick. So for all to be queries, this is especially easy to do because they're not going to access much data, and you know they're, they're doing you know single table lookups for the most part. And so for all to be queries, the, the the query planning we're going to do is essentially try to identify whether a query is chargeable. All right, this is some term from the '80s. I don't know who invented it. All right, chargeable just means search argument able. And all that basically means is that there's an index we could pick for our query, and we know that's the best one to use. That's it. So again, we don't need to have a, an exhaustive search. We just look at all our query plans, or sorry, we look at all of our possible indexes that, that could satisfy our, our, our query and pick the one that has the, that, that has the best selectivity, because that's going to route us to the data more quickly. Again, really simple. I have my, my, my select star from people where ID equals one, two, three. I just have a heuristic that says, oh, I have a primary key uh, on ID, therefore I have an index. Done. I just pick that as my, I'm doing index scan on that, on that index. Right? Again, most newer systems uh, that come along that are doing transactions or doing OTP stuff, th this is what they support first. For the joins, though, that, for the, for that, that's when things is hard. So again, the, as the number of tables we want to join our table, the number of alternative plans are, are, are going to grow. So therefore, we need a way to prune that down. So we're going to rely on what I'll talk about here. We're going to rely on a core assumption that the IBM people did back in the 1970s with System R when they built the first query optimizer. And that is they are going to only consider left deep join trees. So that means that any other alternative uh, join tree structure, well, I'll show what that looks like in the next slide, they're just gonna, not even going to bother doing any search or cost estimation on it. They're saying, that's, we're, not, we're not even going to consider it. So a left deep tree is like this, where along the, on the left side of the tree, that's where we're doing all our joins. Right? So we join A and B, and then the output of this join A and B is then joined with, with the input of C, the scan on C, and so forth. Right, this middle guy here is sort of a hodgepodge, right? It's 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 you know some are on the left, some are on the right, right? And this one here is called a bushy tree, where I do the joins on you know C and D, and then do the joins in A and B, and then the output of those two joins are then then joined together uh, at the at the end. So IBM and System R, they're just going to not even consider these other guys here. They're only going to look at this one. Yes. But the results always will be the same. Right? Yeah. This is actually again. So his his statement is. The result is always the same. Yes, this is the beauty of relational algebra. So the join operator is commutative. So I can put, I can join these things in any way that they want, and the final result is always the same. It's always correct. So therefore, it is perfectly safe for me to go ahead and do this. I'm going to take a guess why they do this other than just reducing the number of plans they have to look at. Think back to when we talked about query processing models. Right, so back then they were doing the iterator model, the volcano model. It's also called what? The pipeline model. So in this case here with the left deep join tree, I don't have to materialize any output from a join operator 
right? It's always then fed into the next join operator. So I do my join at A and B, then I take the output of that join and I now build my hash table to do, or you know, do whatever kind of join I want to do on C. If I had this bushy tree here, I would do the join in C and D. That output then gets written out to like a temp file on disk because now I need to go back over here and now do join A and B. And then now I go back and feed that back in, the, the join I just did over here, read, you know, read that back in, build my hash table, do whatever I want to do, and then do the join with this other guy here. So let deep join trees not, are not always going to be pipelined, but uh, it makes your life easier. And back in the 1970s, they didn't have a lot of memory, so they would have to spill the disk a lot. And so you can minimize the amount of work you have to, or amount of data you have to write the disk in order if you always go left deep. Right. So I, I, this is everything I just said here. So in in today's systems, not everyone makes this, this assumption, uh, but again, I think every textbook talks about this. That, that, you know, they they cut these things out. All right. So how are we actually going to enumerate our our query plans? So the first thing we're going to do is, is enumerate, at the, enumerate at the logical level all the different orderings of our, of our tables we, we could possibly join. Say I want to join R, S, and T. I could join R and S first, maybe you know, T and S first. I enumerate all of those things. And then for each of those, I could then now enumerate all the different possible join algorithms I could use. Hash join, sort merge join, nested loop join. And then for all of those now, I can then also now enumerate all the possible query plans I could po I could have, All right? So you can see how this like search space is is exploding. So what the IBM guys came up with in the 1970s was to use a technique called dynamic programming to make this more tractable by breaking it up into s smaller discrete problems. And we solved the smaller problems first, and at the very end we combine everything all together. So let's look at a really simple example here. So let's say I want to join three tables R, S, and T. So the way to think about this is like it's, a, it's like a sort of search tree that I'm showing horizontally. So this is our starting point here for our logical plan where none of the tables are joined. And then our end goal is end up here where we have R, S, and T joined together. So in the, in the, in the first step, we want to figure out you know, what's the first join ordering we want to do. So we could possibly join R and S first or T and S first. And then for the sake of space, I'm not showing all the other ones, but for all other possible join orderings for this first join we want to do, we, we enumerate them down here. And then now what we're going to do is we're now going to have a compute the, the cost of, of doing whatever join we're specifying here in the first step with our different join algorithms. So again, for sake of simplicity, we're saying we can either do a sort merge join or a hash join. And then now we can just use all those formulas that we, that we talked about before to now compute the cost of executing each of these, these join operators. Right? Again, approximating the amount of disk I.O. we're going to have to do. And so for each node we have in the first step, we're just going to pick whatever path actually has the lowest cost, whatever join algorithm is going to actually have the lowest cost. And that's the one we, we retain. And then now starting from each of these, these, each of these nodes in the next step, we do the same thing and try to compute the estimate cost for doing different joins to get to our end goal here. Right? And then we just end up throwing away for each node here, we end up only keeping the one with the lowest cost to get to our endpoint here. And now we go back and try to figure out well, which path is going to have the, the, the lowest cost for us. And that's the one we'll end up using for this query plan. Right, this is an over oversimplification of actually how, how this actually works, but this is the general idea from system R that, that they've been in, in for dynamic programming. And at a high level, there's sort of two categories of query optimizers. We're only talking about one of them. This one's the most common. Most systems sort of operate this way. Postgres does it this way. MySQL does it this way. Oracle does it this way. Right? You start with the, the, you, 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 the first node is always the starting point when nothing's joined. And then you work from the beginning to the end to figure out how to get to my end goal where everything's joined together. The other thing also over, oversimplifying here, there's no information to tell me about what I'm showing here about the physical properties of the data we're, we're, you know, we're emitting from one opera to the next. So I'm not keeping track of whether things need to be sorted, whether things are compressed or roast or a columnster, all that extra kind of information you have, you have to consider in your search algorithm here. But for our, for our purposes, we're ignoring that. All right, so 
let's walk through this example a bit more concretely. So that's, a, that's the dynamic approach where right? we're going to build out our search to try to figure out which one has, you know, what, what path to get me to the end goal of everything's joined together that's going to have the lowest cost. But let's now sort of all put, put this all together and do the three steps we talked about. So we want to enumerate all the, the join orderings, all the algorithms, and all the access methods. And again, I'm going to emphasize this, no data system does exactly the way I'm showing here. It's way more complicated. But at a high level, you, hopefully, if you understand this, you can then see how to apply it to more sophisticated uh, configurations and setups. So the very first step to join, join R, S, and T, I'm just going to enumerate all the, the different possible join orderings that I have. Uh, but we said that uh, for, for, uh, for system R, we're going to prune anything that is, is, is either a cross product or that's not a left outer join. Right? Those things we, we, we can just drop immediately. So then for each of these guys, so let's pick this one here. For each of these query plans, now we're going to go inside of that and now start enumerating all the different join algorithms we could possibly have. Right? So for, to do this join R and S and then followed by T, I could either do a nested loop join, I could do a hash join. So now I'm going to enumerate, again, all possible configurations of those. And those are my edges going uh, in that dynamic programming graph. Those are my edges going from one step to the next. And then we're going to do the same thing for all the, the, the other uh, the join orders from the previous slide. So then now we're going to pick one of these guys and now try to you know, enumerate all the different possible access methods we can have. So we can either do a sequential scan or an index scan. And then for each index scan, we could, you know, for each index we could possibly have, we would have another enumeration of that. So again, you sort of keep fanning out and having more and more options. And then you use the dynamic programming uh, technique to, to figure out what the cheapest path is. Okay, so is this clear roughly how, how this works? All right, so I always like to show this every year. So again, I'm going to show you how Postgres has, Postgres has a specialized optimizer. But in general, what I've described here is at a high level how every system R-based query optimizer works. They have a cost model that allows them to do estimation of uh, as they're doing dynamic programming search to, to get to the end goal. Postgres actually has two optimizer search algorithms. Again, so they have the system R1 that I just talked about, but then they also have the special one called the, the genetic optimizer, or the GEQ, uh, gen, 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 genetic query optimizer, GEQO. And what happens is that if you have a query that has less than 12 tables, they use the system R approach. But then if you have 13 or more, then they start using this genetic algorithm because it can deal with you know, a larger search space. So with Postgres, they're going to support all the different types of join orderings. So left deep, right deep, bushy, doesn't matter. And as I said, and then they'll fall back to this genetic one when it gets too complex. So at a high level, this works as your sort of standard genetic uh, search algorithm. So my first generation, I'm just going to have enumerate a bunch of different random configurations of my query plan. Right? And, and that's the join ordering plus the, the index scan or for sequential scan plus the actual join algorithm I want to use. And then for each of these, I'm going to compute the cost. And then what happens is I pick whatever which one is the best. Right? So this one has the lowest cost. I'll keep track of that up above and say, here's the best plan I've ever seen. And then I'm going to throw away the one that has the lowest cost. And then now do a, 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 a mix up of the, the traits of the ones that weren't thrown away. So now I'm going to do random flips of the, the genes, if you will, of the, the, the components of the query plan to produce new query plans. Right? And so it's sort of like a, like a random walk. And so now I'm going to do the same thing in my second generation. I find the one that has the lowest cost. In this case here, this one up here has a cost of 80. That now becomes the new best cost I've ever seen. I throw away the one that has the lowest cost. And then I do a random mix up of the plans that, that are kept around. And I generate the next, the next generation. And they'll keep doing this for until a certain amount of time. There's a timeout that says, I'm not, I haven't seen anything else. Or I haven't seen anything better than what the, the best one I've seen so far in a certain amount of time. Or I just exhaust my, my, my fixed time limit. And then whatever comes out of this is the best, uh, is, the, is the one I'm going to use. Yes? So Yeah, the question is, uh, for simplicity reasons, I'm only showing you left deep trees. You could mix it up with right deep and, and bushy trees. Right? You, like, this is only three tables. But imagine you had another three tables you want to join, and maybe one part of it is right deep, one part is left deep, 
I can I can mix and match them as needed. Yeah, but it's hard to draw that. How does it pick out the plants that it needs to consider in the first generation? So, so this question, the first generation, how does it generate this? Random. Like, it has to pick out some specific number out, right? Because if it does it for all the query plants, then you don't need to do anything apart from the first generation, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so uh, your question is, how many yeah. candidates? I don't know how, I think it's probably configurable. I don't know, I don't know what the number is. But yeah, it, it can't be everyone. So there's no point yeah, it's 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 some percentage of like actually probably some fixed amount. I don't know what it is. But again, the, the this cost estimation is the same thing we already talked about before. Right? This is it's the same histograms are sampling, and you're just applying this as you go across. Right? So Postgres is the only one that I know that actually does this. Uh, there was some work in doing simulated annealing, other techniques. This is like a random algorithm, right? Because it's, again, it's not guaranteed to converge. You're not guaranteed to see exactly the best possible option. You're doing a random walk in the solution space, and hopefully you land on something that, that, that's, that's reasonable. So actually, to his point, you obviously want to pick things that are, and your initial candidates should be you know, reasonably good. How they actually do that, I don't know. Because right? if you have all crap here, you have ugly children in the first step, then you have ugly children in the second step. It's not going to be good. So there's, there's probably some way to, to figure out what your initial candidate should be. All right, so any questions about this? Yes? How often do you get queries that have Ah, OK. So his question is, how often do you, how often do you get queries that have uh, 13 or more, more joins? Very often. Uh, it, it depends. For OLTP, you won't. For for analytics, it's quite quite often, yes. Um, right. So think about this. So in a data warehouse, a very common setup is have what's called a, a a a snowflake schema, and the idea is that you have this single table that's called your fact table, and then you have these dimension tables that are, that are around it. So a fact table, using Walmart as example, Walmart has a fact table that's every single item that anyone's ever bought at Walmart. So that table is massive. It's billions and billions of things. But you don't want to store like the name of every single product, the price, and so forth. So you have these dimension tables on the side that says, you know, here's the product they bought, here's the, what store, here's the location. So those are all your dimension tables. So when you do a join and say, find me all the the find me the, the best selling item in the state of Pennsylvania during the winter for this month range for people you know over the age of 35, those are all joins now with those dimension tables. So that thing can rack up very very quickly. The other thing I'll say too is like I always talk to the to the, the database companies and I ask them like you know about the query optimizer because that's the part I'm, I'm most interested about, um, and the metric they always give me in terms of like oh our query optimizer is good, uh, they always claim the number of joins that they can support, and I don't think this is a good metric, but like I've, I've noticed that this occurs every single time I ask them about this, so I think like Mem Siegel told me once that they could do 35 table joins. Uh, uh, and somebody else told me they could do 75, and then Splice Machine told me they could do 135. Snowflake said they can do thousands, and they have customers that actually do that. Uh, it's hard, right? Yeah. Like in this case, what is happening is that T R T and R are being joined on one attribute, and R and S are being joined on the separate attribute. If all of them were being joined on the same thing, like the same column. Then will we also consider plans which first join T and S, then join S and R? Like this sequence you have maintained everywhere T, R, S, T, R, and S, right? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're reading too deeply into the ordering things. It, like, again, joins are commutative. You can join them in any, any possible order you want. No, but like uh, they are being joined on the same thing, right? So T and S, then S and R. If like the same column is present in all the tables. You, 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 you could permute them any way you want, yes. You can. Now, I thought where you're going is, there, like I've shown you two-way join algorithms, like two for loops. There are multi-way joins where you can say, I'm joining R, S, and T on exactly the same attribute. Let me join them exactly the same time. That's hard, and only the, the expensive systems do that. Postgres and MySQL don't do this, yes. What distinguishes the, what do you mean by the? Like, I'm 
I'm assuming that the, the data is not the same for all of them, but I don't quite understand why, like how it would choose which dimension people get to which data. So, uh, um, so this is actually something that the human would curate. I'll I'll cover this maybe next class, or I, I can send post something on 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 uh, Piazza. Um, like you would like a human would have to design the database to say, here's my fact table, here's my dimension table. It's not something we automatically figure out. I'm using the term dimension table because that's that's the, the vernacular for describing what that table lo looks like in a snowflake schema. You have the fact table in the middle, and then the things around it are called dimension tables. But there's from the database's perspective, unless it's a, like a system designed for OLAP queries or analytical queries, it d there's no special designation in SQL to say, oh, you're a dimension table, or oh, you're a fact table. It's just, as humans, we use that term. Okay. Yeah. I'll send, I'll send slides from, from less class, or from this, the, the advanced class. I'll post that on Piazza. Yes? So uh, we get the second generation from the first one after removing the, the maximum cost and doing all the uh, combinations? Yes. OK. And, and one so the idea here is like there's, like, again, it's a, random, it's a randomized algorithm. But, so the algorithm says, this thing has the lowest cost. I don't know why this is the worst. <laughs> But there's something about it that's bad. So rather than propagating through the next generation, whatever its bad, you know, deformed genes are, right? I'm just going to throw it away, and then so there's something about this one that has the lowest cost that I want to propagate forward. So that's why I'll let this thing, you know, get friendly with this guy, right? And then before you know it, you got to go to the hospital on Wednesday, and your wife's giving birth, right? Like it's, right? Yeah. One thing, uh, the third one of the first generation, how is it different from the first one of the second generation? Uh, your question is the, sorry, how, how is what different? This one with the first of the second generation. How is this different than this? Yeah. Well, this is doing, this is this is right deep, that's left deep. But they'll do the same. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's the outer table, this, this is the inner table. So if I'm doing a hash join, I'm building a hash table on T, and I'm, I'm probing with T down here. Join matter. The order matters. Yes? Uh, I didn't understand how the arrows are drawn. Like, for instance, you said that we just drop the lowest, uh, highest cost. Oh. Generation, yeah, yeah. Second, yeah. That should be here. Yeah, sorry. that's a mistake. Yeah, this is just saying that this thing, this guy is allowed to propagate forward. That should be down there. I'll fix that. Okay. Sorry. OK. So let's finish up quickly to what nested subqueries. So this is something we'll cover more in, in the advanced class if you take that. But the, the main way to think about this is that the, it's not like a join because it's a subquery. And we, we want to be smart about how we're actually going to evaluate it. Because right? the dumbest thing we could do is just evaluate that inner query, the subquery, for every single tuple we're looking at and the, and the outer query. Right? My SQL used to do that, and it, it used to be awful. So there's two approaches we can do this. And the idea here is some of these, we can, we, we can do these without having to run a cost-based search. We can do this in part of our rewriting phase. So the first is that we can rewrite the query to, to, to decorrelate it or flatten it out, or we can extract the inner query and run that separately as its own query and then feed its result into the, the first query. So let's look at a more complicated example here. So this is... Uh, so this query here, we're trying to get all of the, uh, say we have a table to keep track of sailors. So this is from when we used to use the old textbook from Wisconsin, and Wisconsin has a sailing club. So that's what this is from. So basically, we're trying to get all the sailors, uh, the name of the sailors where they have reserved a boat on a, on a given date. So we have this inner query here, where we're, now we're, we see it, we're referencing uh, from our, our inner query a record from the outer, outer query. So in that case here, we know that they're correlated, right? Because they're referencing each other. So we can just rewrite this as a join. So again, we can do this in rewriting phase. We can recognize that we have this, this, this predicate up here, and we can rewrite it like this. And then we just do our cost-based search to figure out where the, the right join order is, as before. Let's look at a more complicated example. So this one here, we're trying to find for every single sailor, for each sailor with the highest rating over all our sailors, get the two reservations for red boats, and then find the serial ID with the earliest date in which the serial res reservation was on the red boat. So we had, the main thing is that we had this inner query here where we're just trying to get the max 
sailor rating or ranking uh, for all sailors. So worst case scenario, as we do this look up here, where rating equals and then this inner query, for every single tuple on the outer table, on the, on the sailor table, we just rerun this thing over and over again. But that would be slow, that, that would suck. And so what we can do is then extract that out or rewrite it to, so that we don't have to have that, you know, rerun that every, every single time. So the first approach could be to take this out, this nested block, run it up here, store it in some kind of variable, and then substitute that value down below. So the main thing I'm trying to show here is that the query optimizer doesn't necessarily have to take a single query and only treat it as a single query. We could rewrite it and execute them you know, one after another in order to fill in the values that we actually need. Again, this is something that, that the more sophisticated systems uh, can do. Right, this is saying this is the outer block and that's the inner block up above. Okay? All right, so the, that's the bulk of what, that's, this, this is what we're going to talk about for query optimization for the rest of the semester. As I said, this is something that I'm really interested in uh, and I plan to cover more in the advanced class. This is, this is something that you're interested in getting involved in uh, and want to get started on this. You know, this is, you know, contact me because this, this would guarantee a seat in the advanced class as well. Um, so we talked about how to do selectivity estimations. We talked about the major assumptions we made about the uniformity and independence and the problems with this. We talked about how to do dynamic programming for, to do join orderings, and then we, we can do simple techniques to rewrite nested queries. All right, any questions about any of this? So again, every single time you fire off a query in SQLite or Postgres or MySQL, whatever database you're using, it's going through all of this, which is amazing how fast it actually is, all right, even though it's a really complex problem. All right, so next class, I will be here, uh, and we're going to start talking about concurrency control. So this is the second hardest thing in, in database systems. This is also something if you're really good at, you can also get a job. Uh, this will cover, uh, so we're, on Monday, or sorry, on Wednesday this week, we'll cover the basics of concurrency control theory. Again, Andy theory, not real theory. And then uh, Monday next week and Wednesday next week, I'll have the PhD students cover two-phase locking and timestamp ordering, because th those will be the two things you'll need for the, the fourth homework assignment. Okay? Okay. It. I was going to do extra credit. Um, hold up, let me get the slides. So, releasing the extra credit assignment here today. So, you can earn 10% uh, extra credit for your final grade, right? Not for the exams, not for the project, for the final grade of the entire semester. Uh, if you write a article about a database management system. And so you can pick any database management system you want other than the ones that uh, students have written about before. The way to think about this is you're writing like an encyclopedia article where instead of writing free freeform text like you would in Wikipedia, it's set up so that you can specify exactly how the different parts of the system are implemented. There's options to choose, like how it does concurrency control, what kind of indexes it has, and then you can write information in like you know, a description of what actually it actually does. So for this one, you have to provide citations for everything you do, but again, it, it, everything will be explained on the website. So I've created this website called the Database of Databases, dbdb.io. I wanted to do db2.io, but then that's asking for a lawsuit from IBM, so we didn't do that. So the way it basically works is that it has, has different ways to, to categorize different database systems to find what you're looking for. So in this case here, these are all the database systems that are implemented in Rust. And then there's, again, there's an article here that describes exactly how everything works. And there's citations for everything. Okay? So I will post a sign-up sheet on Piazza for you to, spe to select what database system you want to use. Uh, again, people, this is the second year we've done this, so there'll be, uh, you know, not every single system will actually be available to you. Uh, but there's enough of them out there that th everyone shouldn't have a problem to actually pick what you want. So it'll be first come, first serve. So when I post it online, I'll, I'll, uh, when I post the sign-up sheet online, I will uh, announce it on Piazza, and then whoever gets there first, uh, uh, you know, gets whatever system, as long, long as it's been approved. So the way you think about this is that if you pick a system that's widely known and used, like Oracle, then there's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of information about actually how it works, so you expect to write something that's very comprehensive with a lot of citations. If you pick an obscure system, uh, then this might be problematic because there may not be as much documentation available. So in that case, I can either get you in touch with the people that are actually implementing it and they can provide you information. I've had previous students post on the message boards or message people on uh, Twitter 
they ask them for information on how the system actually works. One student last year picked a system that only existed for three years in the 1980s, and then she reached out to the guy that actually wrote it because he was MIT alum, right? It's actually quite impressive what people have tried to get, get, get this information. And so what you get is, uh, you'll, you'll sign up and get an account, and there'll be a page like this you can go edit. Again, you can see that it's not freeform text for everything. You can select exactly how you know, different parts of the system are actually implemented. So you may say, all right, Andy, what database system am I going to pick? Right? And I'll just say that there's enough of them out there that you should have no problem finding one that you want. So I think I am currently, I am currently aware of 636 different database systems. So distributed systems, embedded systems, systems written in different languages. Going back to the 1968, we have one, or 65. Uh, so again, you should have no problem finding a data system that, that peaks whatever your real interest is. OK? Yes? Why is there a sub network? What's up? It's and giggles. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> it's not real. Yeah. Every, this is actually, this is not even all of them. This is, this is still a subset. This is probably made like 400 of them. There's another 230 that, that I know about. OK, so how can you decide what system you want to pick? You pick the country of origin. If you care about uh, you know, databases written in Brazil or China or India, we have those, right? Based on popularity. Uh, so I know I keep track of what pages get viewed the most, right? I can tell you which one you, you should possibly look at. There's, like, there's this one in France written in, jo or in JavaScript. For whatever reason, Google picks us, picks us up. We get a lot of traffic for that. Whatever programming language you're interested in. If you like Rust, you like Go, you like C, we have a database system written in Bash, right? Like whatever you want, we have something for that. You want to do distributed databases, embedded databases, single node databases, we have those. Disk versus memory, row store versus column store. Commercial versus uh, open source or enterprise, we have we have we have it all. If we have time, we can look at the leaderboard and see which which systems actually appear the most, or which you know what programming language, which country. All right, I got to say this because last year this didn't happen. So do not plagiarize. So there'll be two parts. You're going to submit it in two parts. The first part will be like a checkpoint. Maybe after after Thanksgiving, we'll we'll, we'll look over it and give you feedback whether you're on the right track to. You know, if you're doing the right thing. And then there'll be the final submission during finals week, and that's where you get your final grade. For both of those submissions, do not plagiarize. Last year, we had somebody cotton paste from Wikipedia, and they put that in there. And the reason why we caught them is because they didn't go delete all the brackets you know, for the citations. So we had to go report them to Warner Hall. And it was very, very messy. Okay? So do not plagiarize. Do not copy anything. Do not copy images from the internet. Don't assume that if someone describes the system that they're an expert and they know better than you and therefore you, you, you feel wrong rewriting it. I don't care. Do not copy anything. Because your name's going to go on this. this. This is public on the internet. So you know, if you plagiarize, we have to go report you. OK? Yes? If you cite an image, is that the good thing? The question is, if you cite an image, I'd rather not. You can get by without images. Yes? Is there a difference between the image that represents the database and any images that are in the like, are we responsible for finding an image that... I, I wouldn't worry too much about images. Yeah. Yes? How does the editing of, of previous databases work? Like, if they're, if they're updated, is that something that... So, so, when, so the way to work is, since students have done this in the past, I will, um, they're not, they don't all have the same quality, so I will provide a list of the ones you should not pick from. No, I mean more like, if, when, because... Oh, oh, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I'll, I'll provide guidance for this. You should pick the one. You should always assume the latest version, right? So, if, if they did something like five years ago and it got fixed, I don't care about five years ago. Just describe what it does now. You could mention they used to do it a certain way, but I would focus. If you just focus on what, how it exists now. Okay. Yes. And then in the future, like five years from now, are, are I'll be dead or you'll be gone. Like, don't worry about. It. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Actually, we've had some companies reach out to us, uh, and we, we allow them to edit the, the page. But again, it's like I'm like curating it. I want them to avoid uh, like marketing shit. Like we're the fastest database. Like all that crap. We like keep it very scientific. Okay. Yes. Are we allowed to like if we find another, uh, one of the articles on there that's like old or something? Can we update it? Like just rewrite it? That's also not legal. Uh, we'll, we'll take that on case by case basis. Is there any system you're in particular you're thinking about? Because no. the the Mongo one's actually pretty good already. <laughs> Okay, um, so if you got to go, you can go, but let's, we can quickly look at the website and we can, all right, so wh what, what country has, has, has created the most database systems? USA. USA. Who's number two? Russia. <laughs> he, said, he said Russia. 
He says China. India. <laughs> France and India. Okay. All right. So this is the website. So we can go to the leaderboards. Um, actually, let's do this. So like again, you can click on any database system. Um, and then over here, like it has the country of origin. So he, somebody said China. So it'll tell you how many how many data systems China has. So China has uh, 28. U.S. has. Uh, U.S. has 300. Somebody said, "What was it? What said India? Or what is what is the Indian code? IN." Five? <laughs> Russia, or are you? 21. You're missing it. Germany. 44. Right? France is less. All right, so again, like I, I, so I can click on this, and then I can click like programming languages to implement it in. So this one's written in C++. Right? To 101. What 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 is probably the most common programming language used for a database system? Everyone says C plus plus C. The combination of C and C plus plus. Yes. Java. Right. So we can go. To, so I have this leaderboard thing here. So it's a breakdown of. Right. So here's the breakdown of the countries. Right. Germany is, is number two. Uh, Java is the most common programming language. But again, if you combine C plus plus and and C. Right, then it out outpaces it. And then also we keep track of like what database systems use other database systems. So these are these embedded database systems like RocksDB. A bunch of systems like CockroachDB use RocksDB as the internal storage. And then they have a Go thing on top of it. There's also systems that, that have forked uh, other systems and use that as, as the implementation. So there's a lot of companies that have forked Postgres and use that, and, and as, as well as MySQL. Right, those are the most two common ones. So again, you can see why we're trying to keep track of all of these things, right? Uh, and so I'm aware of, in total, as I said, 630 whatever. Um, so if you find a system, I mean, this would be super helpful if you're, you know, if you're from India or China or whatever country you come from, and there's a database system that's written in that language that I don't know about, let me know, right? Because I, I want to know. Like, this, this thing just goes on forever and ever. Right? There's, there's ton, tons of them, OK? So I'll post this on Piazza today. Project three will be announced either today or tomorrow, uh, and then we'll you know that, that we'll get uh, grade script set up for that, and then we'll have class on Wednesday, and then we next week starting starting Monday next week will be the uh, will be, be my grad students. I'll have office hours immediately after this if you want to see your, see your midterm exam, but I won't be around uh, later in the week. Okay. All right, guys. See you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cents for a case. Give me St. Oz poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam. Oh, how dry. It's with St. Oz in my system. Crack another. I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wild? I'll be stressed out. Could never be sun. Rick is a jelly. Hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed. Yes, my rap is like a laser beam. The boards in the bushes. St. Oz been the king. Crack the bottle of the St. I sip it through those who don't realize the drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people still alive. And if the same don't know you from a can of paint, paint.